Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world, and welcome back to the BSHS Digital Festival 2023. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this session um, from Rosalind Franklin and the Double Helix for Dorothy Hodgkin's Nobel Prize. I'm now going to pass over to Matthew Cobb um, to get things started. Hello. Hello, Matthew. Hello. <laughs> so uh, I think this is the start. Um, just got to get rid of all these things here. Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Matthew Cobb, and this is my co-presenter today, uh, Georgina Ferry. And we are going to be talking to you about Scientists Are Human, from Rosalind Franklin and the Double Helix to Dorothy Hodgkin's Nobel Prize. Uh, and this work is, uh, what we're going to do is I will present uh, about 15, 20 minutes about Franklin, and then we will discuss uh, together about various issues that are raised both by uh, what I've said about Franklin, but also about comparisons, say, between Franklin and George, and uh, Dorothy Hodgkin, uh, because Georgina Ferry, if you didn't know, is the author of an excellent biography. This is the first edition. I believe Georgina has got the latest edition. There you go. Rush out straight away and buy this from your favourite bookseller. Um, an excellent biography of Dorothy Hodgkin. So we're trying to explore uh, some of the myths uh, there are about scientific discovery and scientists. And then BSHS there'll be time... web at bshs.org.uk is the co-host now. OK. <laughs> and... Uh, we will be uh, then answering questions. So please put your questions into the Q&A at any point. There's a little box at the bottom which says Q&A. And if you put them in, then uh, we can read them and we'll come back to them in the last 15 minutes or so. So um, I will now uh, start and... Um, Matthew start. Cobb has started screen sharing. He certainly has. OK, so I'm going to be talking about uh, Franklin and DNA, and this is based partly on uh, some work that I'm doing uh, because I'm writing a biography of Francis Crick and clearly uh, Crick's involvement in DNA and his very close friendship with Rosalind Franklin are very interesting to me. But also it's some work that I've been doing um, with uh, Nathaniel Comfort, who's writing a biography of Jim Watson on the discovery of DNA. And we generally see this as a race between King's College London, which is where Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkins were based, and the terrible duo of Watson and Crick at Cambridge. And this is a race to uncover the structure of DNA, which was seen as the secret of life. And this is very much the image that has been handed down to us from Jim Watson's best-selling account of this uh, moment in history, the double helix. Now, I want to challenge whether it was any of those things, whether it was a race, whether it was a race to discover the uh, secret of life and to explore a bit more about this apparent uh, competition that was going on and look more deeply at the human relationships, which were actually underlying the very rocky road uh, that was taken by everybody towards the eventual discovery of the double helix in uh, March 1953. Uh, and I think the first thing we've got to remember is that DNA wasn't DNA back in 1953. It wasn't what we think of it as the master molecule, the secret of life, and so on. There was a genetic role of DNA which had been claimed, but it wasn't accepted by most scientists. And the only evidence for it came in uh, one, well, one and a half species of bacteria, because the second species, people couldn't replicate it, and in a couple of viruses. Most people thought that genes were made of nucleoproteins. That's a mixture of protein and the DNA uh, that is also uh, the composition of uh, chromosomes. And you got to remember, proteins are astonishingly complicated, amazing, can be any shape, form, size, and so on. Whereas DNA was this, and still is, this very boring, relatively simple molecule composed of four bases uh, and a uh, pair of phosphate chains. So that raised two issues. Firstly, it suggested, well, surely proteins were the, the stuff of genes, not DNA. And in this nuclear protein business, DNA must be some kind of scaffold and the protein is the gene that's actually doing the work. 
But it also suggested that if you were trying to understand the structure of this stuff, DNA was the place to start. And indeed, it had already been done. There'd been uh, Asprey and Leeds had taken uh, X-ray crystallography images of DNA in 1938 and made some very simple structural uh, measurements and had come up with a proposed structure, which was wrong. But above all, it was much easier to study DNA than proteins. And that's why uh, people were interested in looking at this part rather than trying to get their heads around the enormously complicated protein structure. I think the final point you've really got to remember is that there's no reason to imagine that structure and function will be obviously related. Because one of the things about DNA is that you can explain it to a 10 year old and it's obvious what it does. Whereas virtually any protein, unless you absolutely know what you're talking about, it's quite opaque as to what's going on. If you think of hemoglobin, for example, which uh, Max Perutz and John Kendrew won the Nobel Prize for in 1962, the same year as Watson, Crick and Wilkins won for DNA, it was really hard to know what the hell is going on there. It's just this huge, great, big uh, blobby thing. So firstly, let's talk about the personal issues. That's the scientific background, the problems there were at King's College. And King's College had a biophysics laboratory that had been uh, funded by the Medical Research Council that had been set up by a physicist called John Randall. And uh, in 1950, Franklin, who had been working on the structure of coal in Paris, obtained a three year fellowship to work on the X-ray diffraction of proteins in solution. Now, this was a very sexy uh, topic at the time, but that was what she was wanting to do. And then a few months later, she received a letter from Randall saying that um, after very careful consideration and discussion with the senior people concerned, they decided that it would be a good deal more important for you to investigate the structure of certain biological fibers, in other words, DNA, in which we are interested. So basically, she's coming to do one project and then Randall is saying, no, we want you to do this. She goes along with this. She doesn't know what these fibers are. She's never heard of DNA at this point. Uh, he's also she's also told that only yourself and Gosling, who was a PhD student, uh, would be doing these experiments. So she's given a different project and she's also given a PhD student. So she's very much being moved around by Randall. The problem was that somebody else was already, already doing those experiments. And that was Morris Wilkins, who was the deputy head of the lab. Uh, and so he had uh, quite a high uh, view of himself as the deputy head of the lab. And he'd been carrying out X-ray studies of DNA for a couple of years. He was also Gosling's PhD supervisor. He went on holiday and returned to find not only was Franklin in the lab, uh, he didn't know, but also that uh, Gosling had now been taken away from her him and given to Franklin. And virtually instantly, uh, he and Franklin did not get on with each other. They were basically like chalk and cheese. So she uh, was very argumentative and combative. She liked to argue. That was, she came from an intellectual Jewish background where debate was absolutely essential uh, for social life as well as for intellectual life. Whereas uh, Wilkins was extremely reserved. He'd turn away if he was talking to you, hated confrontation, very quiet man. So they were basically doomed from the outset. Um, on the other hand, Wilkins also had a lot of rows with Randall. He was uh, he was could be quite mild mannered, but he didn't half like a row sometimes. So this is a very kind of tetchy atmosphere, not the kind of productive argument that uh, Franklin liked, but much more kind of deep seated and English and, you know, holding on festering rancor uh, that you sometimes get in academic departments. And within a few months, Franklin had made plans to leave. You can see this in this letter that she writes to her best friend, Anne Sayer, in March 52, uh, in which she says, when I got back from my summer holiday, so that would have been in September 51, I had a terrific crisis with Wilkins, which nearly resulted in my going straight back to Paris. And then she says but she decided this was a bad idea and things were now going quite well. So within four or five months of being uh, at King's, she had decided that this atmosphere was absolutely awful. And she also began to think about taking her fellowship away from King's to go and work uh, with um, uh, Bernal at uh, Birkbeck University. And into this terrible situation at King's where no real progress was being made, eventually uh, Crick and Watson 
got involved. Now, they weren't actually supposed to be working on DNA. They were, as you can see from this picture, uh, based at Cambridge in the MRC, another MRC unit, which was primarily looking at uh, was using X-ray uh, crystallography to understand the structure of proteins, which was the, the topic of Crick's PhD. Watson was there on a postdoc, supposed to be looking at the structure of viruses. And yet they ended up being very interested in the structure of DNA, partly because Crick was very good friends uh, with Wilkins. He'd nearly gone to work with Randall in 1947. Um, and Wilkins had been keeping him informed about his interests and the work, the progress of the work of D on DNA. If you read the double helix, then Watson was absolutely convinced that DNA was what genes were made of, and that's why he was there in Cambridge. Now, none of this actually makes sense, and there's no evidence, in fact, that either of them were convinced before they begin work, began working on the structure of DNA that it was the mater genetic material. They thought it was important, but the evidence wasn't there. So how they actually discovered the structure of DNA, uh, I'm only going to go into this very briefly, is that uh, you probably have heard of photograph 51, this image taken by Raymond Gosling, in fact, not Franklin, uh, but uh, which was an image of uh, DNA that, if you read the double helix, is absolutely striking and Watson sees it and immediately knows uh, that they can discover the structure of DNA. Now, in reality, Crick never saw this image. The information it actually contains is extremely limited, um, and it had all been sketched by Wilkins to Crick a year earlier. So there was actually nothing new, and this is a dramatic device that Watson employs to take the story along. And it also miraculously puts him at the center of the process. What they said they were doing was model building. This sounds very fancy, but they later more accurately described it as trial and error. That is, they had they knew the chemical composition of the DNA molecule, and with a handful of uh, data points that they had, they were trying to make these uh, the, these chemical. Uh, components fit into a structure that was coherent and fitted in with these various bits of data. And they weren't using any big, long metal model like we've seen in those pictures. These were cardboard cutouts. This was a two-dimensional uh, attempt to try and work out what was going on. And they discarded every piece of certainty that they had pretty much. For example, although the data from everybody at King's had suggested there were maybe probably strands on the outside, um, and bases on the inside, they tried doing it the other way. They put the bases on the outside, even though there was no evidence for that. They tried to make a, a triple helix, not a double helix. So they were playing around with everything over and over again. And reciprocal base pairing, which is the way that the two strands of DNA bind together, A with T and C with G, those are the bases that hold this kind of twisted ladder together. Um, that played no part until literally the very last day. Uh, they weren't using that. They didn't know about that. It was more the structure that explained it to them rather than anything else. But what they did do in this process of trial and error and making small steps forward over about six weeks was to use some key pieces of data uh, that uh, to check their findings against. And those pieces of data were uh, presented were from King's from both Wilkins and Franklin, and they were contained in this report, which was a, an informal report from the MR, from uh, the biophysics research unit at King's to the Medical Research Council, its funder, to a panel, uh, the Biophysics Research Committee, no, no, no less, which came to King's at the beginning of November, December, in the middle of December, uh, 1952. The report is dated the 5th of December. And Max Perutz, who was Crick's PhD supervisor and obviously worked the MRC unit in Cambridge, gave a copy of this report to Watson and Crick. So this is the moment that Watson and Crick, in fact, using Franklin's data in particular, these are the key bits of information. It's not very much. It's the two, the sizes of uh, the repeat of the helix in two forms of DNA and the change in the size, and also this thing called the um, this monoclinic unit cell, which is to do with the symmetry of the molecule, which, Watts, which Crick was extremely excited by, but Watson was less so. So there's no actual key piece of evidence. We know that they use this report, uh, not just from a very brief mention in the double helix, but from Crick's own account, which he made uh, for a lecture on DNA history in 1961. 
um, which is the first account of the discovery uh, that we know of. And he says, uh, you can see here, MRC mimeographed report that they used it, used these data. But you've got to realize that even those data points, primarily from Franklin, but also from Wilkins, didn't give Watson and Crick the structure. They had six weeks of fiddling about because, you know, if it was that simple, then Franklin would have found out. She would have done it herself. You know, she was no fool. She could have done it. So there's something getting in the way that's preventing Franklin and Wilkins and enabling uh, Watson and Crick to find the answer. Whilst they were doing this in February uh, 1953, neither side knew, but Franklin was hard at work at King's. She decided she got agreement to go to Birkbeck to work with Bernal. Uh, Randall rather cruelly had said, uh, you've got to stop work on DNA. You can work on something else, but DNA is our baby. Uh, you can't work on it. So she's trying to get everything written up before she leaves. She's working on papers, trying to see how she can get the both the A form, which was the crystalline form of DNA, which she was really interested in because she's a chemist. And so the, this is the pure solid that you must clearly be interested in. She couldn't get the data to, to fit any kind of structure. So she then turns to the B form, which you find in much more um, hydrated circumstances, like in the inside of a cell, uh, and which she'd been largely dismissive of and had been primarily studied by Wilkins in the previous year. Now, she didn't quite get there. She nearly gets the structure, but she didn't, like Watson and Crick, she didn't fully grasp, she didn't grasp complementary base pairing, the fact how the bases could fit together and A and T would form a structure the same size as C and G and could therefore consistently fit in these rungs in between the two strands. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that like Watson and Crick, until the very last few days, she was using the wrong uh, chemical structures of uh, bases. This wasn't her fault, it was in the literature, Watson and Crick were lucky that somebody, uh, Don Jerry Donahue in their lab said, oh, by the way, you do know you're using the wrong structures. And they said no. And he said, well, yes, look here. And then first when they used the right structures and then literally when Watson turned one of these cardboard uh, cutouts over, they could see that A and T and C and G bound together. So one of the things I think I'm not going to go into this in much detail, but it's very clear from reading her notes that her chemist's focus on the crystalline form, which was very hard to interpret, led her astray for much of 1952 and prevented her from finding the answer. And I think the key thing you've got to remember is that Watson and Crick are, you know, having fun, yakking to each other for six weeks. Poor old Rosalind Franklin is doing all this on her own, pretty much in a very hostile in environment where she didn't feel at home and was very unhappy. So this, the progress she made was even more remarkable, I think. So this is then what there's an agreement. There's going to be three papers in nature and they're not only back to back. They also have a common title. If you look at the first one, which is from Watson and Crick, Molecular Structure of Nucleic Acid. So nature has given the three papers a common title. There's different. Basically, there's evidence in the, in the paper from Wilkins and the paper from Franklin Gosling. There's no evidence in Watson and Crick because it was just an idea. It was just a theory. Um, so there's three papers now. This is where I want to get back to the, the personal aspect of all this, because surely everybody imagines that Franklin must have been absolutely livid because she was nearly there. And these two upstarts and she clearly I mean, she barely knew them, but she didn't think much of uh, she didn't think much of uh, Watson. And Crick had been quite rude to her when he he'd met her and told her that her data must be wrong. Uh, she didn't think that the A form of DNA was uh, helical. So surely she must have been absolutely livid with these two upstarts. Well. It's not quite so clear. It's possible that, in fact, she knew what was happening in those months uh, when that report from the MRC was shown to Watson and Crick. We found this letter from Pauline Cowan, who was a PhD student uh, at King's, and she was also a good friend of Crick's. Uh, she was using X-ray crystallography, and so she discussed a lot with Crick because he was pretty smart about such things. And here we have this little letter. You might like to know, this is to Crick, that there is to be a colloquium on DNA on January the 28th at 4.30, King's College, room 27C, given by Rosalind and Raymond. But they say that it is mostly to a non-crystallographic audience and that Perutz already knows about it, uh, knows more about it than they are likely to get across. So you might not think it worthwhile coming. 
In other words, she is saying what Franklin is saying via Cowan. Look, come along if you want. We're going to be talking about stuff, but it's not really interesting. And Perutz knows it all. How does Perutz know it all? Because he's been to King's. He's heard the talks from uh, Franklin and Gosling. And he's also got a copy of the report. Now, this isn't saying, hey, show them the report, Max. They would be really interested. But it is indicative of a much more relaxed atmosphere attitude towards data, towards data sharing, towards proprietoral, who actually owned this stuff, who could use it than we might have thought, where we might have this image of Franklin as being very, um, you know, trying to keep her data herself. I mean, the other thing is that at the very outset, it was seen as her discovery. This is from the Royal Society's uh, summer exhibition, the Convat Saxioni, as it was called then. And you can see this is the first public uh, portrayal of this, and it is presented by Franklin with all their names there. Uh, also tells us that DNA is a very long, thin molecule. And this is, I found this recently, this is another letter from Franklin to her best friend, 1953. She summarizes that she's moved from King's and it's much better at, at Birkbeck, but she's still got problems. She explains what she's doing. She's starting work on uh, x-ray work on viruses, that she's getting some stuff from the cold board. And then later on, she says, really, the only interesting thing that's happened as far as I'm concerned this year was a wonderful summer holiday I had in Israel. In other words, she doesn't actually mention oh, by the way, I've discovered the secret of life, but those swines stole it for me. Or I just, we all discovered the secret of life. It's not even mentioned. And now we can't include anything from that, except it's not mentioned. But I think it, it does suggest that this was not at the forefront of her mind. Above all, later on, in the next a year later, she becomes very friendly. She shares her data uh, on Tramaco mosaic virus with Watson, which she clearly she wouldn't have done if she thought he was a thief and going to steal her ideas. She tried to get a transcontinental lift with Watson. Good God. Um, she says here, I'd love to come with you going from Chicago to Pasadena. That didn't actually happen, but she did later visit the seedier parts of Pasadena with Watson and Brenner at their instigation. They trying to shock her she didn't let them show that she was know that she was shocked um she became very good friends with the cricks here's letters from cricks saying come and stay with us come and see us sometime come again discussing data discussing papers and all the rest of it indeed she went on holiday with the cricks after a conference and when she became ill she convalesced twice with them However, just to remind you, if you don't know, by April 57, there were further complications with her um, ovarian cancer. The suggestion uh, suggests it was terminal. She carried on working for another year, but eventually she died on 16th of April 1958. And Brenda Maddox's biography of Franklin concludes her lost prize was life. And I think that's much more important than focusing on who should have got the Nobel Prize or whatever. Um, also note, this is her gravestone in uh, the uh, Wilsdon uh, Jewish Cemetery. There's no mention of DNA. There was no there's no mention of DNA in her obituary in the New York Times. It was all about her work on viruses, which at the time was seen as being much more important. So to conclude, the double helix wasn't necessarily a big deal in 1953. Watson was obsessed that the structure might be wrong. And indeed, it wasn't completely right. Uh, but that was it just needed fiddling with. But there was no proof that it was correct until the 1970s. The double helix had no consequence for decades. Uh, you couldn't do anything with it. It was like the Higgs boson. Very interesting. But and the structure function link about DNA looks absolutely obvious to us, but it is very rare. There are very few examples of structures of molecules, uh, biologically functional molecules that immediately tell you with, without knowing much about it, what it does. Finally, just remember that DNA was only proved to be the genetic material in eukaryotes, so that's organisms with a cell, uh, with a nucleus rather in their cell, in 1975. Until then, it was technically a working hypothesis. Viruses and RNA were the exciting stuff, which is why Watson uh, and Crick and Franklin all started to study them as soon as they'd published their papers on DNA. They stopped working on DNA, left that to Morris Wilkins to count the rivets, and they got on with the really exciting stuff, which is trying to work out how DNA uh, did what it did. So I think what's striking about DNA uh, is that we don't see the people. We see the, the molecule. We see its later impact. 
And the role of social interactions in research are incredibly important. We've got here a competitive group, certainly, but ultimately friendly. I mean, Wilkins and Franklin, no, I don't think they ever got on. Um, but in terms of how she saw Watson and Crick, they were ultimately a friendly group. And everybody after 1953 moved on until Watson published his book in which he portrayed Franklin in such a bad light in 1968. And as we've seen, even when they were studying similar problems like working on viral structure, there was no evidence of any hostility between them. And our view of this moment, I think, is twisted both by Watson's book and by our current views of how labs should behave, that they shouldn't talk to each other, that it's incredibly competitive, there are huge stakes, there are Nobel Prizes to be won. That is not the world that was living in in 1953, because you've got to remember uh, that the past is a foreign country and it's full of humans, people with complicated mixed motivations. If you want to know more, uh, read Franklin's uh, amazing biography by Brenda Maddox or this brilliant art article by Angela Crager and Greg Morgan on her work after the double helix. And uh, the article I wrote with Nathaniel Comfort is free on nature. And with that, I will stop sharing and uh, Georgina and I um, can have a chat. And don't forget to put your questions into the Q&A. Um, I can't see any at the moment. Uh, so please put your questions in there and tell us, ask us any questions. Right, Georgina, how does that, do you think, um, are there lessons to be learned from biography and from understanding uh, social relations in science or should we just be concentrating on the data? Uh, you know what I'm going to say. Obviously, <laughs> uh, science is an intensely social activity. Uh, and really the, the joy of working as a biographer in the field of science is that you do get the opportunity to look at the sort of archival material that you've shown some of us, um, some of to us, um, the letters, informal letters to and fro from different uh, colleagues and friends uh, who talk about how it felt to be doing what they were doing at the time, what was important to them. Um, uh, and I think the idea that history of science is all captured by the published papers is very, very misleading um, yeah. because that drains uh, the, the, the humanity from the work, leaving just this uh, pure sort of intellectual thread, um, which I think can in, in many ways be quite misleading. Um, I, I'm very interested in um, your presentation of the three papers um, in in nature at the time. Um, I mean, the, one thing I would kind of pick up on is that you, see, you seem very keen to almost say they didn't need Franklin's work. I mean, that's putting it a little oh, more did, yeah. strongly than you do. Yeah. But no theoretical advance in science is worth the paper it's written on if it's not backed up with evidence. Absolutely. And as you rightly said, Watson and Crick never collected any evidence themselves at all, um, no. apart from the theoretical considerations. Uh, but the data, the actual data that came from looking at a real piece of DNA, all came from either Wilkins or, or Franklin and Goslin. Um, uh, and so, um, yes, I, I, I think you're right to, to say it was, a, it, it, it was a joint effort between the two of them, but uh, nevertheless, that's not how it's gone down in history. No. Um, and it's not, <laughs> how uh, the, the scientific community recognized it um, in that, um, yes, I suppose, well, yes, maybe I'm wrong there. Wilkins did share the Nobel Prize, so that the, the one of the data gathering people did share the yeah. Nobel Prize. Um, but it's always talked about as, as Watson Crick's structure. I mean, I think he, he, Wilkins called himself in his autobiography, the third man of DNA. And I think that's, uh, that's very much how he saw himself and how the world has seen him uh, and what that makes Franklin. I'm not quite sure. Um, the dark, yes, the dark lady. Oh, the dark lady uh, yes. um, and we are, you know, it, it is a terrible loss to us all that she died so young yeah. um, because she was clearly uh, on her way to uh, having a, a really distinguished career. And her work, yeah. I mean, I think one should say it was perfectly reasonable of the bitterest the focus on her Absolutely. virus work. 
because her virus work was extremely important. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, that's what I was trying to get over by by saying that DNA was not DNA. I mean, you know, it 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 meant, you know, if you as I said, if you think about the Higgs boson, right? We all know there's a Higgs boson. What can we? Do? It's very important. But what can you actually do with it? And you couldn't do anything with a double helix. You just learned it. I mean, I learned it at school, um, you know, uh, but they had no consequence until the middle of the 1970s when you could start to engineer with it, you could start to manipulate it. And whereas well, her work... Um, I don't think that's quite right either because it did have the con consequence that it set off the, the, the next race, which was to find out how it... Um, you know, the DNA makes RNA makes protein yeah, change, absolutely. how that worked. And that but was it's a still a it's, period of molecular yeah, it's still it's still not a it's still it's still not an active process. You can't intervene. You can't do anything with this double helix structure. You can you can show how it. I mean, it inspires both to understand how it replicates and then also how it works. But you're still stuck in terms of it. I mean, it's not the stuff that we think of today in all these different ways you can manipulate it and so on. And that's one reason why. Um, they, I mean, even when you're studying the genetic code, you are primarily, you're studying RNA. They're not studying DNA, right? They're not using DNA. It's the RNA they're interested in. That's what they're manipulating. Um, and the, the fact that it's a double helix, the structure of it is not terribly <laughs> relevant to that you can you know you didn't if, if it had been at some other structure you know it wouldn't matter you'd still be doing those experiments but we're caught up in this uh, the assumption for a start there had to be a link between structure and function and you had to be able to see it immediately you know whereas uh, both crick and watson and linus pauling all came up with triple helices which apparently you know fitted the structure the structural data they didn't but nearly uh, but it didn't tell you anything about how how the molecule might work. Um, I wonder whether you could tell us, say something about women and X-ray crystallography. I know you've written about this because it, it kind of, especially with, with with Dorothy Hodgkin, who I think is, I mean, it, it says something about our collective imagination that people know about, about, uh, about uh, Rosalind Franklin. There's a coin, but, you know, it's a 50p coin with Rosalind Franklin's name on it. But if you say Dorothy Hodgkin, not only to the person in the street, but to many students of molecular biology or biochemistry, I guess a lot of them won't have heard of it. What, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, I think I've I think I've watched three episodes of University Challenge over the years at which neither team has managed to identify Dorothy Hodgkin. Uh, and the, the clue in each case was that she was on a stamp. I mean, she's been on two stamps. Um, so, you know, Rosalind Franklin might have a coin, but Dorothy Hodgkins had stamps. <laughs> um, uh, oh, goodness, this opens so many, so many routes. Um, I thought you were going to ask me whether X-ray crystallography was full of women. Um, well, that's, that too. <laughs> that's another question. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that um, the field of X-ray crystallography was founded by the father and son team of William and Lawrence Bragg all the way back in 1913. And um, they had just been living in Australia, in Adelaide, in fact, which was a much more sort of liberal part of the world than any, any uh, British university town. And they came back to Leeds. Um, and uh, the elder Bragg sub subsequently became director of the Royal Institution, the chemistry laboratory at the Royal Institution. Um, and he decided he wanted to get a really good uh, young student into his lab. So he decided he'd just pick whoever came top in physics in the whole of the University of London. And that person was Kathleen Lonsdale. Um, so one of the first uh, students that Bragg recruited into his lab in London um, was, was Kathleen Lonsdale, was a woman. So the, the fact that he discovered that the person who came top in physics in the University of London was female made no difference to him whatever. And she subsequently married a fellow, fellow researcher and had kids. And he made a point of getting grants so that she could pay for childcare, she could pay for help in the house, and go on um, working on her on her uh, on her work. And and I think that attitude that crystallography was an appropriate thing for women to be doing, uh, and that they should be supported to do it, has spread through the field. So that um, I mean, Hodgkin herself was inspired to take up X-ray crystallography after reading about Bragg's work. Um, she never actually worked for Bragg, but she obviously knew him. 
uh, and the person who did supervise her was J.D. Bernal, who was a former Bragg student. So you can trace yeah. this um, succession of um, uh, really inclusive ideas about who, who might or might not work through that. And then, of course, she was the, the chemistry fellow at Somerville College, an all-female college in Oxford, and so she had a lot of students, some of whom went on to do X-ray crystallography. So women did get into the field as a result of this particular chain. But I, this is not research I've done myself. However, as a result of which, those who do know about these things, they know about Kathleen Lonsdale, they know about Dorothy Hodgkin, they know about Rosalind Franklin, and they're inclined to then go, oh, so the field of X-ray crystallography is saturated with women. <laughs> and this is not true. Um, somebody has actually counted the numbers and the numbers of women in X-ray crystallography throughout its history um, has never been higher than it is in, say, other bits of biology. It's okay. probably higher than it is in straight physics or chemistry. But then it's um, an interesting interdisciplinary field. And I think that's provided opportunities for women where there were there may have been very kind of straight laced silos of physics and here and chemistry there and maths over there, which would ha harder for women to break into. Um, but I think women in these multidisciplinary fields, um, I envisage them as coming up through with the cracks in the paving stones, like really vigorous weeds, um, <laughs> and they're able to take opportunities, the opportunities that are there. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, uh, but you were, so you, were, the... you were really asking me a different, a different question. Well, right? before, let, yeah, before we go on to the second, the other question about the comparison with Hodgkin, it's perhaps it's worth reminding ourselves that Franklin, of course, went to Newnham College, which is a, a women only college and still is today. Um, I mean, I don't, she didn't have much option at the day, back in the day because Cambridge didn't accept uh, women except into uh, Newnham and Girton. But other universities are available and she could have gone somewhere else. So she chose to go to that particular environment, which is clearly nurturing uh, for women uh, intellectuals. Um, but she was also inspired to um, go move from straight chemistry, start to be interested in the coal, to go to, to Paris and to learn X-ray crystallography by the French uh, chemist Adrienne Vey. So we've got you know, there, there are layers of kind of female you know, support and recognition and nurturing of uh, female academics at this time, at a time when it's it's just beginning, the cracks, the, the cracks are beginning to open up, uh, partly, obviously, uh, because of the war and all the changes that the social changes that were eventually uh, ushered in. And it's clear that in, in parts of chemistry and in parts of X-ray crystallography, uh, that did benefit or that did help some women to uh, flourish. But what I was asking you, yeah, the second question I was asking you about the, the, the contrast between Ferry and, uh, sorry, between uh, Franklin <laughs> and Hodgkin um, and in the, in the imagination, but also in what they were doing and the kind of work they were doing. Um, well, I think actually there are, there are strong similarities um, in the way they approached their work in that they were both very much practical hands-on x-ray crystallographers. They were not theoreticians. Yeah. Um, not like Crick, which was his thing, yeah. Sorry. Not like Crick. Crick's thing not like was, Crick. you know, Crick was, no. you know, sums. Um, uh, Hod the, where they differed was that Hodgkin did believe in model building. Yeah. Um, but she, 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 was, she was very much interested in, in data, in, in collecting data. Um, but in the early days of crystallography, the data was thin. Um, and, and you had to exercise your imagination quite a lot. And I think certainly the way others have described Hodgkin, and I would, I would certainly go along with this from what I've read about her, is that she had an uncanny ability to take minimal data and using her enormous background knowledge of chemistry. And I, I think she was a better all-round chemist than, than Franklin was probably. She, she was extraordinarily well-read right across her field. And using that background knowledge uh, and little bits of, of data, uh, she was able to entertain possibilities about what structures might be uh, in a way that other people found quite unnerving. Um, that you know that, that they would spend that they would have had to spend hours calculating. And, and the thing is, it, you know, you could never know you were right until you had done the calculations. But by taking a decent stab at what you were getting from your data, it could speed things up because it narrowed down the range of things that you had to then uh, go and check. Um, and and that's, that's something Dorothy was extremely good at. Um, do you, but do you, do you think wasn't... that was, sorry, do you think that was similar to uh, what Linus Pauling was able to do? 
um, you know, famously with the Alpha Helix, this part of uh, the helical motif, which excited people so much in 1951. Yes, I mean, again, like like Watson with his bits of cardboard, I think um, Pauling did play about with little with, with models and until he got the, the thing that he wanted. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, he he was. I think I think Pauling probably had a uh, a good theoretical brain as well as a good practical brain. I mean, he'd made it um, a very important um, theoretical advances in chemistry before he even started yeah. um, getting interested in in the crystallography of. of yeah, and that, that's what he won. That's what he won his Nobel Prize for in '54. It's the chemical Indeed. bond, not yes. for this. You know, this uh, not terribly interesting, except that it was a, a part of a protein that somebody had finally been able to identify the structure of the the, the alpha helix. It was for his yes. more fundamental work that yes. he won. Yeah. Yes. But um, the personality is completely different between yeah. Hodgkin and Franklin. Um, Hodgkin was um, extremely determined. Uh, but non-combative. I mean, she was a person who believed in every walk of life that there wasn't a problem that couldn't be solved by dialogue. Uh, mm. And so she would talk to anybody and talk things through with people. And she did believe in sharing. Um, uh, and for instance, when she was working on vitamin B12, uh, she had a colleague working at Princeton uh, in the US, John White, um, who had done some of the work and I think saw himself as to a certain extent in competition with Hodgkin, uh, but she made an advance that that apparently would have got her ahead of him. And and the way she resolved it um, was to co-publish with him, uh, and he was satisfied with that. And they just published the work together as a as a collaboration. Um, so she 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 believed in receiving credit for the work that she and her group had done. So in that sense, she was competitive and she did care about winning. Um, she was, I mean, one of my interviewees told me that she was actually very disappointed not to be the first to solve a protein structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, the protein structure she picked to work on insulin was just much more difficult to do than yeah. hemoglobin. Um, it didn't have the same bilateral symmetry, which just made it much harder. Um, but at, at the same time, she shared... It, you know, she was delighted. Max was a really good friend of her. Max Baruch was a really good friend of her. So uh, it, at the same time as being slightly crestfallen that she hadn't got there first, she was delighted to share mm -hmm. his, his um, uh, in, in the joy at his, his discovery. Um, but she didn't, she didn't go in for ding-dongs, e even sort of academic, you know, intellectual ding-dongs that didn't mean anything personally. That wasn't the way she went about things. Um, she would um, just, you know, ask people very gently what they were doing and say that's really interesting and um, and had had you thought of doing it like this and uh, you know gently encourage her colleagues to to uh, move their work along. Uh, maybe you could. Uh, I can't remember the exact uh, headline in the Oxford Mail um, when she won the Nobel Prize. Do you? It wasn't do you, the do you... Oxford Mail. It was the Daily Mail. Oh well, that's that explains it actually. Right, <laughs> the Daily. Tell us, tell us about <laughs> that then. How it was you... It was every newspaper. Uh, I mean, this is something actually we don't, I suppose, because there was never any press coverage about Rosalind Franklin's work that I'm aware of. No. Um, but Hodgkin was the first and is still the only British woman to win a science Nobel Prize. So that's clearly going to make a big splash in the media. Uh, and the Daily Mail headline was Oxford Housewife Wins Nobel Prize. Um, and I think it was the Telegraph said something like, 18,000, whatever it is, pounds prize to mother of three. And the Beckles and Bungay Journal said, Nobel Prize for former Norfolk girl. <laughs> uh, this was in 1964. Since 1960, Dorothy Hodgkin had been the first, uh, sorry, the second Royal Society Research Professor. She was the first Wolfson Research Professor of the Royal Society. Uh, she was running a big lab. Um, she had a, an enormous publication record. Um, uh, she'd been a, Royal so a fellow of the Royal Society since she was 37, which is quite young to, to be elected. Uh, and yet, as far as the media were concerned, the fact that she was married and had three kids was the only thing that um, made her uh, distinctive. So, um, what, what did she? What did you know? What she thought about that? Did she? Uh, was she furious or, did, or amused, or did she ignore it? 
I, I'm, I, history does not record. I, I've not <laughs> found. <laughs> Maybe she didn't know. I mean, you know, unless she read the mail or the one of the other newspapers you mentioned. I mean, she might not. Uh, oh, I found the cuttings in her files, so she didn't ah, know. Ah, okay, so she didn't. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, we've got a um, we've got a, a couple of questions. If you want to write a question in the Q and A, uh, do hurry up because we're going to be finishing in about ten minutes. I'll just know uh, the, there's a couple of questions. First one is from Brigitte. Uh, it says, "Do we know why Watson portrayed Franklin so negatively in his autobiography?" Um, I think you're going to have to wait for um, my uh, friend and colleague, Nathaniel Comfort, to finish his uh, very careful analysis of the different versions of the double helix. So the double helix went through several mutations uh, in the 1960s. And uh, as I understand it, the initial versions were nowhere near as uh, sharp in their negative characterization of, of, of Franklin, because if you haven't read the book, spoiler, she comes over as this kind of harridan and a shrew, a stubborn person who can't see the evidence in front of her eyes. Whereas, you know, a crystallographic novice Jim Watson can instantly grasp things. Um, so uh, I, I, I think it's for I think there may be deep psychological reasons, but I think one of them is that he's trying to ramp up the drama in the book. And the, the book was intended to uh, excite and interest young people in science and having more drama in it. So having Watson and Crick as the bad boys stealing her data adds a, a bit of excitement. I mean, there's an element of truth. They didn't ask her and they should have done. Let's be absolutely clear about that. They were it was what they did was not right. And had they done the right thing, maybe things would have been a bit easier. I don't know. Um but uh, I think that's that's probably the explanation. Um, the second question, uh, can I, maybe can we... I just add to that? Yes, please do. <laughs> I mean, he was a blatant sexist, apart from anything else. I mean, a lot of a lot of uh, the double helix is about his pursuit of what he calls popsies around Cambridge. Um, and he was the, desperate. The... He was desperate to <laughs> desperate to get laid. Uh, uh, yes, and very I, honest I, I, account of a of a young man's obsessions, perhaps. Um, and also there were very, I mean, uh, there were very few women, female students or, you know, available women who were, I mean, you might think, uh, if you take a look at Jim Watson when he was 25, perhaps it's not surprising. Uh, and given his manner and his attitudes. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, I think you also need to abstract the difference between maybe the young man and the old elder man and his certainly what's happened to him since. But or maybe he was always like that and he kept it under control. And now he doesn't care because he's old and he can say what he thinks. But yes, I mean, I mean, it is a very unpleasant uh, book and it must in many respects. It must be said that um, both uh, all of Wilkins. Uh, Crick, uh, Perutz, and uh, especially uh, Klug, who'd worked very closely with Franklin, all wrote to Watson saying this is when they read the early drafts, saying this is outrageous uh, and were very, very cross. Uh, and in fact, they convinced Harvard University Press uh, not to publish it. Um, but all that happened was that the publisher at Harvard went to Knopf, uh, a commercial publisher, and took the book with him and made a fortune there. So Harvard kept their hands clean, but uh, not made the money, as did Watson. Um, so the second question, uh, still, you've got time to ask Georgina a question about about um, uh, Dorothy Hodgkin, if you want. Um, this is from Javier, who wants to know whether institutional affi affiliation matters in scientific research. Um, uh, that she worked at King's, Franklin worked at King's. Um, and that her previous affiliation was the starting point of contact with Watson and Crick. So even if she left by King's, she still had come into contact with the Cambridge researchers. Not quite sure I quite understand, but let's deal with the fundamental issues. Does affiliation matter? Did Dorothy Hodgkin, being in Oxford, was that essential to her or could she have been anywhere? Could she? What would have happened if she was working with Max Perutz, do you think? Um, I mean, it depends at which point in your in in her career you jump in. I mean, if, if she had been, she 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 always wanted to be her own boss. 
So she couldn't have gone and worked with Max because then she would have had to work on Max's problems. And actually the reverse was also true. But David Phillips, a very distinguished um, researcher from, um, was he also, did he also come from King's? He's certainly from a, oh no, I think he was from the Royal Institution, but he moved to Oxford uh, when she had, was very senior um, to, uh, well, she thought to sort of take over her group when she retired. Um, but he said to me very firmly, he knew there was no way he could work um, as part of, of Dorothy's group because he would then have just been working on Dorothy's problems. Okay. Um, as a young woman, then I think her connection with Oxford was absolutely critical. She got a first class Oxford degree, which does mean something. She got excellent references from entirely male um, tutors, uh, which sent her off to Cambridge to do her PhD. So she's got an Oxford first degree, a Cambridge second degree. Uh, and that's where she worked with Bernal, who was an extremely important mentor all her life. Mm -hmm. um, and the again, as you mentioned, in relation to Newnham, being in Oxford means that as well as being in this big prestigious university, you're also in a small all-female college, because obviously the Oxford colleges, again, were, were single sex. There were only five. There were five for women in Oxford, and she was at Somerville. Um, Somerville uh, gave her a fellowship before she'd even finished her PhD. They recognised her ability. She was the first science fellow they'd ever had. They'd always had to farm out their science students before. When she had her children, when she was still early in her career, they gave her maternity leave, which was not something that was available anywhere else in the university. Um, so that it, it meant she was able to continue working uh, right through World War II when she, she had two kids and then she subsequently had another one. Um, so, yes, I think uh, being on the Oxford-Cambridge axis was very important to her and Somerville College in particular um, was critical to establishing her career. And so we're going to, there's no more questions, so we're going to kind of wind up now i wonder if you could what you think about the so you've written you've written uh two key biographies of, of, of crystallographers um the other one is of max perutz um what so they're, they're both nobel prize winners and big shots uh and we know about the lives of the import you know the important people however that's defined but clearly the personalities and the behavior and the attitudes of the other academics of the technicians of everybody else who's involved in the scientific process we don't know much about them how how can we i mean is it do we need to know those things and how can we find out given that the difficulties there are for biographers of big shots who've got archives that you could easily go and look at i mean uh you know um i wonder what you you thought about that well you find a lot of other people in the archives and yeah. uh, because, uh, I mean, I've only written about people who uh, very recently passed away, uh, plenty of those people are still about and you can go and talk to them. And I, my approach to writing biography is to use interview as much as possible um, mm -hmm. and very much to show that these, as you say, big shots, the people whose, whose individual names we know, depended on a network of close colleagues and more distant colleagues and correspondents and so on. And, and re really, it, it's terribly important to get away from the idea of the scientist as the lone hero, particularly, because especially in the, the 20th and 21st century, uh, because it, it, it ain't like that. Uh, and these network of, uh, this networks of collaborators are in, in extremely important. Um, unfortunately, this takes us back to the question you were asking before about why nobody would heard of, of Dorothy Hodgkin. That I think it's just true of scientists in general, not just women yeah. scientists that they don't do their work in the public eye. Um, so, you know, if you think of pop stars or sports people or politicians, um, they're immediately thought of as interesting biographical subjects because people have that name recognition. And it's only the scientists who get to the very, very top to achieve any kind of name recognition. Uh, and in fact, if you do, as I once did for a radio program, stand in the street and ask people if they can name a scientist, if you're Einstein. really lucky, they might come out with Einstein or Marie Curie. But that's about it. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's simply because science tends to be carried on in a separate bubble to the rest of life, uh, whereas other kinds of distinguished person um, have some kind of it, they, they have to engage with the public in order to do what they do. Um, you have to have audiences for theatre performances or football matches or tennis matches. Um, and you have to have voters for politicians. Um, whereas we, as the general public, um, don't directly engage with the work 
that, that scientists are doing. And so we, we never get to hear about them. And so publishers don't think we'll be interested in reading about them either. <laughs> okay, well, so um, scientists are human folks, don't, uh, don't forget it. And there are lots of them, not just the handful of uh, individuals we know. And I guess it's a challenge to historians who are writing about processes or um, or you know, networks of people to actually try and tease out some of those social relations, intimate individual relations, which, uh, as we've seen, both shaped uh, Franklin's work with what with and against Watson and Crick, but also uh, Dorothy Hodgkin's work. So I think we're going to close it there. Uh, is there anything you you want to say to wrap up, Georgina? Are you are you okay? Uh, well, I think we're all looking forward to your book coming out. Matthew. <laughs> well, don't hold your breath. It's going to be it's going to be a long time coming. I'm I'm still only in 1960, uh, and he he's he carried on working until 2004 when he died. So there's a lot a lot to go. Um, and what are you working on at the moment? Oh, uh, nothing big. <laughs> nothing big. Okay. Well. I'm writing a lot of obituaries. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that that's not a job that will ever go. You'll always be needed. <laughs> to be certain of that. Okay. So uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks to the British Society for the History of Science team behind the scenes who you can't see, who've been doing all the magic and making it work, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, carry on watching. There's still more uh, astonishing and insightful and stimulating talks to come. Uh, and thank you very much. And good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are uh, in the world uh, watching this. And thank